Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 350. Science Faction, I call BS. This is also Science Faction, Damien's the champion, because I won. La- I, I've actually gotten a couple perfects, and Did you, you found a way to steal. But last week, I you, you didn't get a perfect, by the way. You didn't get a perfect last week. Okay, but I've gotten perfects. In, in the, the last four mm, weeks have wrong, been very good sure. to me, Science yeah. Faction. You haven't been very uh, good to uh, me, really? but Science Faction has been very good to I me. I seem to remember you losing last week. Is that, uh, no, that's not true. I, that in right. fact, in fact, I, I don't even remember I, who won last week, actually. I won, and that's what you did. Mm, you ignored it. I don't it. think so. I don't think that's what happened. But speaking of somebody who never ignores a winner, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist, Robert <laughs> Timothy. With me, as always, is my perennial loser, comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I wish you would ignore the loser as well. I guess I could ignore you. Yeah, that'd be fine. I'm just shouting penis into the microphone and nobody's responding. <laughs> Bobby, I'm bad. Punish me. And the Viking scientist of science faction himself, Dr. Nick. Dr. Nick, how you doing? Doing great. And ready to whoop some Damien. Hell yeah. Pretend like he's the Irish villager in 860. I want everybody out there in podcast land to know that Dr. Nick is as physically intimidating as his voice leads <laughs> yes. you to believe. Uh, sweet talking to me won't get you out of this. Yeah. Thing. And the broadsword on his back is also, I peed a little. D- Dr. Nick, you got to be the buffest guy that's ever in a any kind of room with a large telescope. Is it weird that every one of your colleagues has to be either... A grossly obese person who who couldn't jog half a mile, or somebody who's never lifted anything that weighs more than twenty five pounds. I, I feel like you were unjustly stereotyping <laughs> astrophysicists everywhere. I will beat the fuck out of every astrophysicist <laughs> whose name is not Doctor Nick. <laughs> it is, and I'll do it at the same fucking time. I swear to God, it'll be like that thing where how many room full of toddlers can you fight? Only it'll be astrophysicists, <laughs> and it'll be guys who are built like our ex astrophysicist Seb, <laughs> who I swear to Christ. That guy once got into a fight with a Yorkie and lost. <laughs> that's what he calls people from New York. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate. Uh, yeah. He's colored your opinion. Yes, that's <laughs> for, right. For, for, all of you. for a lot of things. <laughs> There's one way to settle this. I need for you to bring in the sexy astronomer's calendar 2018. Oh, that would be good. <laughs> they all look like you, and I remain erect from January to December. You win. All right, all right. Well, I'll get working on that right away. <laughs> if I can't finish by the time I get to December, Bobby wins the argument. I got a Hubble chubble. <laughs> <laughs> all right. For those of you guys who don't know, I call BS the game where I read four science news articles, some of which are real, some of which are BS standing for bad science. They can all be true or all be false or any combination of in between. Are you guys ready to play? I am. But before we get started, if you were to test the water, if you were to go into work on Monday and say, hey, guys. What do you think about a sexy calendar? What do you think the response would be? Oh, We're too buff, gee. bro. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, gotta work my bod. Yeah, yeah. There'd be maybe one other person who's interested. Okay. Well, we'll see it. We'll fill it out. We'll fill it out. Okay. Pretend you're the public. How interested should the public be in seeing this calendar? <laughs> I mean, everybody likes a freak show, right? Like, <laughs> P.T. Barnum was famous for a reason. <laughs> it's interested the right word. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move right on to I Call BS. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. Ring, ring. I Call BS. All right, article number one. A new poll confirms that the American public trusts religious leaders to act for the public good about 25% more than it does scientists to do the same. Damien, is this science or bad science? Uh, I want to say this is science, but that number 25 seems very low. (laughs) Oh, you think they would trust them more than 25% more? This isn't fucking Europe. Like, uh, this is America, where like, that's people, true. people are like, scientists are putting hormones in the water, which are making the frogs gay, which is in turn making the bees gay, which is why they ain't reproducing, which is why we ain't got no bees, just gay bees. <laughs> Science. It's interesting that the, 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 the kind of redneck in your scenario is so concerned with, like, bees in the ecosystem. We only have one Earth. I am a host of just multi-dimensional <laughs> right. other redneck this is, stereotypes. This is, Not uh, stereotypes. this is a nice callback. All right, and Doctor. Oh wait, so what was your final answer to science? I think I said science. Yeah. All right, and Doctor Nick. Oh man, he's going. He's going science. I'm. Uh, I'm also kind of curious about that awfully specific number. If you I'm remember, not- 
the science, the I call BS rules are that if the thing is true but the number is wrong, it has to be off by a factor of 10. So it would have to either be less than 2.5% or more than 250% for me to call it false <laughs> if I state a number. So then it's really, do I think that the public trusts religious leaders more than scientists? I'm asking myself that question at this point. It's like, scientists are awfully curious. Uh, they just want to solve problems. It's not necessarily always in the public good, though. That's did, true. Did a religious leader do the math? Or did no, they did not. The okay. I guess we're uh, Catholic uh, leaders included. Yeah, in that's what I was going to say. It's like, <laughs> like in Damien's analogy, it's like, look at these scientists messing with our crops where all the priests are doing is touching kids. <laughs> a man who doesn't protect his corn is a no man at all. <laughs> Fuck up, Junior. Put hair on your chest. <laughs> I mean, it's not your hair, but... <laughs> oh, oh, no. Lord. Good oh, no. Lord. <laughs> oh, jeez. That's what the priest was saying. <laughs> I'm finished, child. <laughs> My child. Uh, oh, fine. Let's call it science. Don't uh, <laughs> Dr. Nick doesn't even care anymore. <laughs> he, just wants the, he just wants it to be over. All right, article number two. A North Carolina man became the most recent victim of a brain-destroying single-celled amoeba that can be caught from swimming in freshwater lakes and that once infected with has less than a 3% survival rate. Damien, is this science or bad science? You know, the other week we talked about wasping. You know, yes. like uh, people... Meth heads uh, are, are, in, inhaling wasp spray yeah. to get high. I think this is science. And I think that's how wasping starts. Like, oh, my God, I just inhaled a deadly amoeba. Quick, I need to smoke some roach spray. So he, he squirts the roach spray up his nose. Then he gets high. He, but he has to do some trial and error, right? He has to do redneck science where does he put more amoebas in to get high or more wasp spray? <laughs> All right, now let's try it as a suppository this time. And record the results this time, Cletus. All right, and Dr. Nick. Wait, which way did he go? He went science. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, you know, I was, I was also thinking science because those uh, brain-sucking amoebas are, are horrifying. Mm, they are. Oh, my gosh. Uh, then you, you got me double uh, second-guessing myself. Just because he said it, so you're like, he must well, be yeah, wrong. Yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, if, oh, God, this is always the, the hard part about going second. This is obviously harder going second. Yes, I know. That's why that. I feel sorry it's for you. It's not harder <laughs> at all. You have so many advantages. And also, before you – I am the current I Call BS champion you as aren't. I'm coming up. I have the belt. I'm doing a dance right now, holding it above my head right now. It's literally a homemade belt. <laughs> And okay. it's actually just suspenders. He didn't even know what a belt was. <laughs> just a pair of rainbow suspenders yeah. holding above my head. So I'm thinking that survival rate might be like more like 30-something percent. But then uh, brain amoebas sound pretty bad. So uh, I'll, I'll go with science on this one, too. All right. On to article number three. A new study looking at the carbon footprint of transportation methods confirms that public e-scooters are the least carbon impactful way to travel. Damien, is this science or bad science? Is it bad science? Bicycling, walking, and pogo sticking are still available as modes of transportation. I feel like pogo sticking would take like way more energy than just walking. You need a more powerful spring, bro. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Dr. Nick. I'm uh god, I you know, I hate I hate agreeing with Damien. Um you know, you know it's like the e-scooters, you gotta build the battery. There's so much That's production true. line behind those. And we are talking total life of the scooter, so that would yeah. be included. And if uh and you know Pacific Beach is anything to go by, right. they last about a day before they end up yeah. in the Pacific. So yeah. it just doesn't <laughs> seem like a very viable uh you know, not a viable green solution there. So I'm going to have to say bad science. There's got to be something better than but, that. By the way, there's a thing now that assholes are doing in San Diego. And if you guys have never been to San Diego, one of the interesting <laughs> things about our downtown area is our, the topography is incredibly hilly. Like more so than almost any down. You, you Aside from San Francisco, you're not going to be in a downtown with more hills and steeper hills than you, you would see in San Diego. We have hill envy in San Diego. Yeah. Actually, San Francisco. Uh, I'm sorry, guys, but they're mesas, okay? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Uh, one of the things assholes are doing here are cutting the brake lines on those scooters because nobody checks the brake lines. So you just get on the scooter and start driving, and all of a sudden you're going downhill at 20 miles an hour with no brakes. And they're not exactly like – you don't have the ability to, I don't know, skid out like you would with a bicycle. Like it's just kind of – I got to well, bail. Mean, if you're a badass. You yeah. <laughs> actually, those things actually have governors on them, unfortunately, that limit your speed downhill to like 15 miles an hour. I got them, I got them to 20. So, ha. Huh. <laughs> he cut the brakes. Yeah. <laughs> Shows you. Eat that bird corporation. All right, and lastly, article number four. 
A new paper has traced a mysterious cloud of nuclear radiation that passed over Europe in 2017 to North Korea, indicating a nuclear materials processing plant had a leak that spread worldwide. Damien, is this science or bad science? Bad science. It was the Russians, and they made the frogs gay. Okay, and Dr. Nick? Uh, unfortunately, in that position again where, where uh, I'm going the same direction, though for a different reason. Okay. So we'll try and separate it on that. If you, if you had a nuclear signal and you thought it came from North Korea, it seems you wouldn't blame stockpiles. You'd be blaming all the nuclear missiles they've been testing mm. underground and having issues with. So hard to know exactly maybe the source or what's causing it. but um, Interesting and, reason. And narrowing it down to that amount, especially when they're right next to China, seems hard. Let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Well, I mean, we know that my answers were so good that Dr. Nick copied them. I almost actually, 100% I'm of the pretty time. sure you copied him in advance. Yeah, the fact that you did it before it doesn't matter. You still copied him. Like you, 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 Damien, did you have the same answers as Dr. Nick or not? I did, but oh, I yeah, went yeah, first. So but you, I went first. So you had the same answers. So you copied him. Yeah, I assume you've been doing some AI you know, learning to set up. If I was a teacher dudes. and I saw a test <laughs> and you and Dr. Nick had the same answers and you were sitting next to each other, I would automatically assume you copied it. Except that I took the test and turned in the test before he took the test. So you cheated even worse? <laughs> I had Dr. Nick phoning in the answers to me. I just, I see, I'm giving you two zeros now. I'll never collude with Damien. You know what, Damien? I didn't want to admit this, but it, you might have won last week, but I'm now taking that victory away from this cheating event. <laughs> you, you don't have the power. You need... I, t- I do. I called the principal. <laughs> you are not the governing body of I Call BS. I like how you're like a rambunctious kid who's asserting what rights he does or does not have. Damien also has a rule that if I don't show up uh, after 15 minutes for a podcast, then he gets to leave. <laughs> Freedom of movement. Stop uh, me. <laughs> all right, let's go back and see how you guys did follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. A new poll confirms that the American public trusts religious leaders to act for public interest about 25% more than it does scientists to do the same. Both of you guys thought this was science, and this one is bad science. It is the opposite. It found that scientists have tremendous trust to act in the public good, and they're about 25% higher than those of religious authorities, which is actually a really good sign. Yeah, my bad colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> so work a Satan right there. So it did have a good end number. It's about five thousand. They chose a randomly distributed group of uh, people throughout the United States. In big that, cities. That, no, it was throughout all fifty states and throughout both rural and urban populations that were retrospectively well, how representative. Rural? I mean, were they able to get them on the phone? Uh, assumingly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Ironically, it used to be like in the 30s, if you get somebody on the phone, it meant they were very cosmopolitan. And now if you do it, it means they're dumb enough to pick up their phone on a cold call. (laughs) Uh, The study looked for varying levels of trust in different people from scientists to religious leaders to the military, which, by the way, military was just under scientists. Scientists were the top ones with about 86 percent of the public believing that they are acting in the interest of public good. Military is at like 80-something percent, low 80s. Well, I agree. Every every time we start a war in the Middle East, my life gets better. Yes, like, totally. I think all of our lives. Elected officials tended to have the lowest at 35 percent, which is also somewhat contradictory to ourselves because who the fuck elected them, you idiots? So, you know. And why is the incumbent reelected at yes. such a high fucking percentage? They also looked at news media, business leaders, public school educators. And in terms of trusting either a great deal or a fair amount, scientists just barely beat out the military with 86% of respondents reporting those high levels of trust versus about 80% for a military, 47% for religious leaders, 35% for elected officials. And by the way, that 86% for scientists is up from 76% in 2016. So not only is this good news, but it's actually very strongly trending upwards. It would be interesting to examine what the factors are in that. What is it that- Baby boomers dying. It could be. But, like, 2016 to 2019, that's only three years, right? So, like, what is it within those three years that have given the public greater trust in science? And Catholics molested a lot more kids. <laughs> maybe. Maybe, but it's not just in relation to religion. So it's not just the differentiation between those two. It's the objective numbers of people saying that that are getting higher. I wonder if it's the fact that things like the anti-vax movement, which peaked in, like, I don't know, 2007, is, like, dwindling out, and then, therefore, those people who are very anti-science are getting pushed to the fringes. Are Gen Xers dying? I wonder if the rise of Flat Earth in 2016 has essentially created a pushback from the general public that's like, you guys are fucking shit. We got batshit crazy. We got to separate ourselves from you. We're going to trust scientists, not the crazy guy yelling about Flat Earth. I'm very interested because you said— uh, religious leaders sat at that, and that's just a blanket statement. And yeah. this is America, so yes. I want to see 
the, the you know the Protestant pastor right. versus the Catholic priest right. versus the Muslim imam. Right. And I want to see the trust levels in America. Yeah. Versus the Buddhist monk. You know who knows? It, it would be interesting to to develop, to pull all that out. But I'm also very interested in why that is. I think that's great. That's a great trend if it turns out to be true and not you know a, a survey error or something. And if that trend does tend to be true, I'd, I'd be very curious to know why that is. I'd like to know that like 10 to 12 percent that have upped their game. I would like to know if you looked at the 2016 numbers or the 2018 numbers, what changed their minds? Like what swung more people into that direction? I, 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 and this is my this is my explanation for why I'm cautiously optimistic about the future. Yeah. And I, I stick. I think it applies here. Baby boomers dying. Yeah, well, that's Baby true. Boomers <laughs> dying. And right. That's a gift to the earth. That's the best thing that they could do. I gotta say, I'm almost uh, a little curious about wh which type of scientist is driving this up. Yes. So they actually then looked at they they did divide some of these numbers a little bit more specifically Ooh. and looked at like research funded by industry tends to have lower confidence in it, which is valid, right? And then like you know what type of sciences did seem to have the most support versus the least support, and all of those are interesting questions. But again. There, if there's a big general trend like that, 2016 to 2019, not that big a time, right? That that should be rather similar. That jump is pretty notable. That's very statistically significant. I would want to know where that came from. I'm curious to see. I'm sure there's been a jump in it, but I'm curious to see if it, because uh, I know it was always lagging behind, but trust in biological scientists just yeah. from creationists here. In, yeah. In good old U.S. of A. <laughs> All right. You put Yosemite sound gun noises behind that. <laughs> All right, article number two. A North Carolina man became the most recent victim of a brain-destroying single-celled amoeba that can be caught from swimming in freshwater lakes and that once one is infected has less than a 3% survival rate. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. As Dr. Nick mentioned, these brain-destroying amoebas are fucking nuts. And I wasn't actually that aware of them. I later found out why, which is that this infection is shockingly rare. We've had 146 cases since they started researching it in 1962. 146, but only four people have ever survived. And those four people are not in good shape. And here is why. This thing gets into your nose through water. So if you're swimming in a warm freshwater lake, specifically if sediment has been stirred up at the bottom where the amoeba lives, it can get up in your nose. If it infects your brain, you're fucking done because it basically treats your brain the way it does bacteria. It usually eats bacteria. It surrounds bacteria, basically encompasses it and breaks it down and kills it, and that's how this amoeba lives. It does the same thing to your brain tissue when it gets in there. It starts jacking your brain. It automatically kills large portions of your brain that you can never get back or regrow. But as it's doing that, your immune system starts going crazy and starts attacking it. That causes intracranial swelling, which almost always kills you. Even if you can survive the intracranial swelling, the amoeba t destroys so much of your brain that if you aren't dead, if you're one of those four people, you're essentially a vegetable or you're highly impaired anyway because so much of your brain has been damaged and you'll never grow that back. The real mystery is why does it affect those 146 people but not everybody else? There are millions of people in contact with water that has this amoeba in it every single year. A tiny percentage of people who get it, but then the ones who get it almost all die. No sediment. You have no <laughs> sediment. Yeah. Maybe it's getting down, but I have to imagine there are hundreds of people who are digging at the bottom of ponds in <laughs> Florida every year, like getting sediment stirred up that still aren't getting it. So is it the density of the amoebas that are getting into the nasal cavity? Is it a genetic susceptibility to this particular amoeba? Is it some kind of rupture in a skin membrane? What is the, the X factor that's causing some people to get infected? I Who's mean, I stir up sediment when I go swimming in a pond, but I don't yeah. usually try to snort it. Yeah. But I mean, you ever done lines of pond, bro? <laughs> well, another way people get it, you know those neti pots, like the things you use to clear out your sinuses. Oh, they work amazing, man. You but should try it. If you do it without using sterilized water or purified water, and you just do it with tap water, people get it that way too. See, that's bullshit. Like the, that that you get it from tap water, that's crazy. Yeah. Like, like if if you just were like filling it up from a lake, I'd get that. Well, it's unfiltered. I, that amoeba can live naturally in kind of warm water, and the pipes that can sit in the summertime in your house can be warm water, and so it can happen that way. Just as you're terrified of prion diseases, yeah. like I first heard of neti pots right about the time that that like one case of, of somebody getting that amoeba mm -hmm. by using a neti pot came out, and like I was dying of allergies, and uh, I, uh, my then wife at the time was like, "Use the neti pot, use the neti pot," and I was like Bobby with a prion disease, "Get <laughs> yeah, that yeah. thing away from Get me, devil away. woman! <laughs> Trying to kill me with amoebas." 
anyway, if you're going swimming, don't stir up sediments. The really dangerous thing about this particular thing is the, the symptoms mimic like a cold at first. And by the time you would go to the doctor to realize anything wrong, it's too late. Your brain is already fucked. You're already having horrible problems. And even if you survive, your brain would already be too damaged by then. And by the way, we don't have a good way to kill amoeba. Guess what? It's not a bacteria. Antibiotics won't work. It's not a virus. Antivirals don't work. We don't, have a, we don't have a good way to test for it, even if we suspect it's there. And we don't have a way to kill it, even if we know it's there. So basically, once you get infected, you are fucked. So uh, yeah, stop snorting sediment bottom at the bottom of warm lakes and ponds. How much cocaine is on the bottom of that lake. That's the first well, question. Well, considering most of the infections are in southern states like Florida, a fuckload. Okay, get some meth in that shit. Article number three, a new study looking at the carbon footprint of transportation methods confirms that public e-scooters are the least co- carbon impactful way to travel. Both of you guys thought this one was bad science, and this one is bad science. They found that they actually have some problems, particularly in the manufacturers, Dr. Nick mentioned. Remember, we have some lie-on battery issues. We have some electrical control issues. A lot of those, it takes a lot of energy or carbon output to be able to produce a thing like that, including melting the steel and producing the batteries and the electronics and all of that kind of stuff. But you know what the big impact is? is that at the end of the night, people drive around pickup trucks and vans to go pick them up, bring them to the house, charge them, and then drive them back to a place to distribute them. And that turns out to be a huge carbon part of their carbon impact. So because of that, the actual electricity they use to charge and stuff is less than 5% of their overall carbon impact between those other two factors. So they can still be a really good alternative to things like driving a car. It's still way better than driving a car. It's still way better than actually even taking a bus if the bus is empty. If it happens to be a full bus route, that full bus route is better for the environment in terms of your carbon footprint than those e-scooters. But if it's an empty one, then the e-scooter is better. But, you, I mean, that bus isn't going to, like, stop. I mean, that bus is going to continue on its route. Get on the fucking bus. Take the bus. If Don't. Yeah, I mean, you can make that argument. It's just how much energy it's taking to move an individual, right? So you could argue that e-scooter is going to sit there whether you use it or not. And, and all of the carbon footprint has already been used to either build it or put it there charged up. So it's the same argument either way. But in terms of how much you use to get some places, cars are obviously going to be the worst. The, you know, an empty bus is not necessarily going to be great. The best is still bicycles, even electric bicycles. Huzzah! Yeah. They are the ones, even electric bicycles, which have lie-on battery problems, just like those scooters do, the electrical control issues, just like those scooters do. But because you don't have somebody driving around picking them up, there's just something you own, and you drive someplace, and you leave it there. Well, in San Diego, you do have people driving around picking bikes. Yeah, that's true. That's reason. very, very true. <laughs> because of that, bikes, even electric bikes, are still your best option. Obviously, walking would be too, but you can't really include that as a system because that's just what you – that's the default. You know, that's what happens when the scooter breaks down. It's all down. rigged against pedestrians. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you can still do the bicycle thing if you're really interested. And you know what? So scooters aren't bad for the environment, but I do like things where you calculate the actual impact of it. It's like when we talk about the cost of coal and gasoline, and they say, oh, well, look, you compare it to to wind power, and you have to have these offset taxes to make wind power viable. And it's like, do you know how many fucking handouts we give to coal and gasoline industries where we're not calculating the amount of energy it takes to pull it out of the ground or to process it in this way or to ship it across the country? We just leave those out, whereas the wind comes to the windmills for free. All right, and lastly, article number four, a new paper has traced a mysterious cloud of nuclear radiation that passed over Europe in 2017 to North Korea, indicating a nuclear materials processing plant had a leak that spread worldwide. Both of you guys thought this was bad science, and this one was bad science, meaning Dr. Nick wins again! Yeah! Dr. Nick cleaning house like he would in the Astronomer's Fight Club! I'm not doubting the last part of your statement, but... (laughs) He copied everything I said. You copied him. You you blatantly and obviously copied every answer he did slightly before he gave that answer. I did. I was staring at the piece of paper that you gave him with the answer. Yes, on that's it right. <laughs> this game started. And when you cheat like that, Damien, you don't prosper. All right, indeed. Cheating's only good in a monogamous relationship. <laughs> Keep it out of I call BS. <laughs> Indeed, this was false. It was traced to a known Russian processing plant with an unacknowledged nuclear incident that happened on September 26th or 27th of 2017 at the Mayok Production Association, a nuclear facility in the Ural Mountains of Russia. We actually reported on this leak when it happened in 2017, when all of a sudden a bunch of radiation detectors in Europe started going off. They're like, what the fuck happened? Something's going on. We have no idea what this is. It was a release of ruthenium-106 throughout all of Europe. It was a cloud of it that basically came over Europe and they started flipping out and they basically were able to trace it back and triangulate it to one place, which was a known 
nuclear processing facility in Russia. By the way, Russia hasn't come out and said, we had a leak, we had a problem, there was a nuclear incident. They haven't said shit about it. They've, they've been hum. We only got this by looking at a bunch of detectors and like back running everything and figuring out where it was from. Classic Russia. Yeah, and because of the type of radiation, we can tell that it wasn't because of like a Chernobyl-type experiment. It was because of a, a, a processing, the processing of nuclear materials because you wouldn't have ruthenium-106 from a, you know, a Chernobyl thing. But it was a leak that was worse than Fukushima in terms of overall radiation that was released. However, because the resulting cloud was really diluted, it didn't really cause any statistical harm to the people beneath it, and the total radioactivity was between 30 and 100 times the level of radiation released after the Fukushima incident. So even though it was a huge amount of radiation, because of the way in the style of which it was released, it didn't co necessarily cause the cancers and damages we would expect from something like Chernobyl or Fukushima. It was diluted, but b because of that reason, it actually was more dangerous to homeopaths. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, homeopathy, of course, the more you dilute something, the more powerful it gets. Uh, the radiation, there's a whole bunch of them dying of severe radiation poisoning right now. <laughs> bunch of spontaneous leukemia. Oh, man. Very, very interesting stuff. It's super interesting because... So think of nuclear reactions, right? We can see their impact all over the world. What about the stuff that we can't see? Like, what kind of crazy microbiology experiments or anthrax experiments are going on in Russia that we won't get the tail end of that let us know what's happening, right? We only got, we only got the knowledge of this because somebody fucked up and there was an accident at that plant. And who knows, by the way, how many people died in that accident or what happened there. But something happened and somebody fucked up, and that's how we got this information. But if they're creating super smallpox or something, we'd never fucking know about it. Yes, we have finally distributed brain-eating amoeba into North Carolina. It is only a matter of time until capitalist dogs fall. In, in two decades, we'll have 148 deaths. <laughs> <laughs> very, very interesting stuff. All right, thank you, Dr. Nick, for coming back for Science Faction 350, and thank you, audience, for coming back, where you learned about how much the American public trusts scientists, why you should never snort the sand at the bottom of a warm Florida lake how big the carbon footprint is on one of those public e-scooters, and the origins of a mysterious cloud of radioactive materials hovering over Europe in 2017. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back next week for Science Faction 351. It's not the size of the carbon footprint that should give us pause. It's the girth. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right.